I really am very honored to be uh, joining the stage with such uh, great individuals. Um, so our topic for today is uh, deep diving into outsourcing in 2020, how COVID-19 has forever changed the clinical trials landscape. And uh, we, it is four o'clock on the East Coast, but hope everybody is ready for some action and uh, wake yourselves up because it's going to be a great panel. Okay, let's get started. So a lot has happened this year. It's been really uh, shocking if you actually sit back and think about all the change uh, that has been going on in such a short uh, time frame. Um, so definitely in the face of adversity, we've seen all kinds of different businesses uh, take swift action to both innovate and partner, uh, not only for uh, their success, but also for survival. Uh, so that has been very important. I think the, uh, the word has been pivot. Um, so that being said, when we talk about uh, COVID-19, uh, it definitely requires rapid action and innovation in any industry. Uh, in our industry in particular, we, we really need to partner. Uh, the, the challenge requires us to join forces. It's simply impossible to be an expert in, in, in all of these fast-paced uh, developments that are uh, being thrown our way. Usually, such partnerships take a long time to develop, uh, easily months and years. Uh, yet, we have seen some very fast-moving companies able to develop these uh, very meaningful partnerships and, and achieve success in days and weeks. Uh, so we have seen that companies have been pivoting and partnering their way through COVID-19. Uh, so we have assembled an esteemed panel here to help you understand how you can evolve and modernize your company's outsourcing strategy to adapt and thrive in the new clinical trial landscape. So love to introduce our panel. Uh, we will start with Catherine Arbor, uh, who is joining us from, from Alexion as the Executive Director in global, of Global Clinical Data Management. Go ahead, Catherine, love to hear your introduction. Thank you, Farah. Very nice to be with you all this afternoon, morning, evening. Um, so at Alexion, I'm lucky to, to lead the traditional data management, but also our very forward-thinking, technology-driven data management, where we're using um, a lot of analytics and different ways of thinking. And that really played positively for when COVID came to us. So I'm here to share that information, and I look forward to talking with you. Great, thank you. Uh, and we also have Beverly Papiorello, who's the SVP and Clinical Operations Consultant at Intellia. Beverly, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I will give you a perspective of uh, transitioning into a biotech position and understanding how to be efficient in utilizing kind of technology uh, and also learnings from others that have been there in the COVID situation and how to piggyback on that um, and to be strategic about how you apply that within the construct of building out a new organization and taking your first drug to clinic. Beautiful. Uh, and we have Mustafa Noor, who's the Interim Chief Medical Officer at AMAG Pharmaceuticals. Mustafa, would you like to say hello? Yes, hello everyone. A pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I will be able to give you a perspective from um, a, a, a perspective of a, from a company that has a portfolio of mature products, uh, com commercially available products, as well as programs in late stage development. Um, so this will be more of a more advanced uh, pipeline than Beverly's um, biotech uh, perspective. So I hope that will complement her view as well. Absolutely will. Uh, we also have Shannon McQuarrie, uh, who is the VP of Clinical Trial Operations at Cato SMS uh, to provide the CRO perspective. Thank you, Farah. I'm uh, looking forward to this discussion today. And uh, the perspective that I'm hoping to bring is uh, much more operational in nature, but certainly when all of this struck 
uh, we had a, an entire portfolio of in-flight studies, but certainly other considerations that we've had to roll out with respect to how we're planning new study launches and keeping things on track with respect to timelines and milestones and the different kinds of providers that we're working with and the type of evaluation that we have to go through when assessing how we'll put a strategy together because it's, it's not necessarily how it used to look. So looking forward to the discussion. Absolutely. Uh, we're also joined by Shaheen Lakan, who is the Executive uh, Medical Director at Zogenics um, and has supported many companies in their uh, development. Go ahead, Shaheen. Great. Uh, thank you, Farah, uh, fellow panelists. It's great to see you as well and uh, the audience. Yes, I'm Boston-based uh, and I can provide uh, a, quite a bit of perspectives from a number of companies that I've engaged with uh, over this COVID-19. I've uh, done um, uh, biopharma, biotech uh, vendors and technology solutions uh, to support uh, trial development. And uh, interesting, I've been part of maybe three or four over the past uh, several months during this pandemic, and I could uh, share uh, this experience with this audience. Thank you. Excellent. And finally, we're also joined by Jay Rosak, who is the director of ClinOps at uh, Dicerna Pharmaceuticals. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy to be returning after my uh, discussion this morning um, and building off of that. I have um, some direct re uh, relatable experiences as we um, have managed our way through uh, continuing our rare disease program uh, through COVID and how we have managed to uh, ensure to uh, stay on track during these times. Excellent. Okay, we are going to get started with a poll question just to make sure everyone is paying attention today. Uh, so we're going to start with a simple one. Question number one, Sam, if you can bring them up. Has COVID-19 impacted your company's outsourcing strategy? Yes or no? We'll give you a couple of seconds to answer that. Sam, do we see the results right away? In just five more seconds, I will close the poll. Okay. Three, two, one. Okay, pretty, uh, pretty overwhelmingly yes at 83%. We'll go to the next question. Poll question two, how has the pandemic affected your provider base uh, and vetting due diligence process? So there's actually three choices here. Uh, increased vetting, we need to ensure we select the right partners. Decreased vetting, linked to volume, resource, or time constraints. Or the third is uh, no change. Another five or so seconds, three, two, one. Interesting. So we've seen that uh, the 63 percent of respondents have indicated that they are uh, looking for increased vetting uh, to select the right partner. So I think that's a great segue into our conversation here where we are talking about uh, outsourcing as part of a strategy in clinical operations. So we're going to start with a general question to the panel. Uh, the pandemic has forced many companies to rethink their provider base as critical new services have emerged. We've seen that kind of echo through uh, the discussions today. Uh, so just an open question. Did your organizations launch a COVID-19 work stream related to partner relationships and provider selection? If you want to jump in, maybe raise your hand. I'm trying to see uh, who can uh, respond to that one. I'll happy to uh, start um, and then maybe the others can uh, jump in. So sure. um, certainly, I mean, I think that uh, th this is an unprecedented time. Uh, we're, we're asking, we're dealing with issues that uh, I think a lot of us uh, hadn't even thought of uh, and we're forced to revisit uh, uh, the way we conduct business. Um, so certainly in the 20 plus years that I've been in industry, this is the first time that I see it disrupted at a global stage and at the level uh, that we're seeing. And I'm sure many of you um, are in the same boat. Um, I think one of the, from clinical perspective and clinical trial conduct, uh, one of the ways that a pandemic has forced us to rethink uh, our strategy is, uh, one that I think in some ways could be as difficult in the short term, but it could be actually beneficial in the long run. And that specifically is that rather than um, bringing 
patients to clinical trials were being forced to bring the clinical trial to the patients. Um, and, you know, and a lot of these parallels are, you know, very much what we're observing in the clinical medical practice setting where um, patients and providers are able to hold virtual meetings um, or virtual visits and care can, a lot of the care can be conducted um, virtually um, and except for certain procedures, et cetera, um, day-to-day activities, a follow-up of labs, um, discussion of test results, things like that can be conducted um, virtually. And I think a lot of those things, learnings from that and the change in the pattern of the ways that medicine is practiced uh, these days can be you know, replicated in a clinical trial setting. So I think that in that sense, I think uh, what I don't want to do is you know, repeat what I was just uh, beautifully, Sean, uh, explained to us how it's being done, but in a way that we have to kind of think or you know, change our ways of thinking, how we approach clinical trial and look at the clinical protocols from a perspective of what is really can be done virtually, what uh, elements of this protocol can be brought to the patient, and what are our capabilities uh, that we currently have, um, both internally and also with the vendors and the partners that can do pivot that way, can b- conduct the clinical trial in a way that we can bring the clinical trial to the patient. So I think that's the overarching theme that I feel is the change that was forced upon us, but I'm hoping that it will be a, a change in a force for the better going forward. Thank Farah, you, Bev, go ahead. Of, um, so giving, uh, again, uh, we play off of each other very nicely in this half. Um, so giving a little bit of a perspective from really kind of the early um, company at this moment in time, one of the things that also forces you to do is actually plan earlier, right? So we put a whole COVID plan together that talked about, you know, as you come out of the first wave in the spring, how does that play with what you're doing in the fall and the trials and what you're and how you're bringing them up? And so we actually moved up the selection of several of our vendors so that the plan would be that, you know, things like central lab where you know you know the lead time is is so much and that's something that requires people to be in a space to do it and so instead of getting kind of stuck with potentially the vendor we select not being able to go in and build the kits we we moved everything up in our timeline um, so that we wouldn't be at a place where we wouldn't have things like lab kits and those things that are material ready and available at that time so that's Mm -hmm piece of the lens of how you think about your providers and maybe your typical timeline of six months or four months, give yourself a bit more time to, to allow for some of these, you know, changing pieces and also to work through what your strategy is around each of those vital pieces necessary to get your study up. Absolutely. Great comments there. I'm going to move to the next question, uh, unless somebody else wanted to jump in. Don't see any hands. Okay, let's move on. Thank you, Bev and Mustafa. Um, Okay, next question. I think this segues really nicely onto um, Bev's comments. Uh, Expanding a provider base under the stresses of trial continuity, a landscape of uncertainty, and tight timelines presents some unique challenges. How can technology play a role in helping to better uh, or faster identify, vet, compare, select, and manage providers for new services? I, I can start. Um, so again, you know, I've been through big pharma down into the biotech. And so obviously, I think everybody has different ways of approaching um, how they vet uh, their various um, vendors and, and bring all that together. I will say that um, we had a very short timeline to to pull some things together. And so um, I was fortunate enough to have uh, an individual who's very seasoned in outsourcing 
um, direct me to what are some of the options around technologies when you don't have your own bid grid and you want to get through a lot of different vendors, not just the CRO, but you know some of the other ancillary vendors very quickly. So we actually institute so through Farah's organization, um, we looked at a couple of different technologies in this space and actually spent a long time doing some of the vetting around just even the purchasing of the software. I will tell you that um, our experience was we were a little bit late to the game on getting our vendors um, into queue to select. And we made up about four to five weeks by having the use of that software, forcing it out to the, to the various CROs, um, and having everybody's bids come in in a consistent way, but the analytics around being able to look at all of that in a very quick manner was extremely useful. And we had our selection within three weeks of putting out our bid, and that included having all of the vendors in for the, the vendors we selected to go to part two to come in for bid defenses. And so using the technology available out there and not building it yourself or, or worrying that you've got to do something uh, of that nature, there's there's several choices out there. We chose Clinical Maestro for multiple reasons, um, and I think multiple companies. If you take a look, you'll understand how we got there. But um, I will say that that software was uh, impressive and value added, and and was well worth the um, the spend. And we'll continue to to utilize. Great, thank you so much, Bev. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Um, Catherine, I know you had uh, quite a bit of um, sure, change yeah. in this space and in, in, at Alexion uh, around yes. the reining them in. <laughs> Would you like to share some of that? Well, I was going to share um, for our phase ones with healthy volunteers. We, we are a, a rare disease company and it's global. So um, we have a proprietary tool, which I'll talk about in a little bit later where we were able to use forecasting to where COVID would go and kind of dodge where we were gonna open these short-term healthy volunteer studies because many of the locations had to close and they didn't close necessarily in the same time. Um, so we were using technology in an AI analytic fashion to try to predict where COVID was going to flow and then go to phase one units that were not in those locations and then oscillate them. So that was a, a huge advancement for our ability to continue to move on with our phase one research. Very fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, I'm going to move on. I'm just uh, cognizant of the time here. Okay, this is a question for Shaheen, uh, but definitely would, would love others to jump in. Uh, so Shaheen, you shared with me about your uh, great experience assessing technology tools for various different companies uh, to be applied in clinical trials. Um, and you'd mentioned observing greater polarization in the resiliency of the provider landscape, certainly in the face of uh, COVID-19. Uh, can you share some of, of that experience with us and your insights? Oh, sure. No, no. Thank you, Farah, for, for the question and, and the premise, too. Uh, First and foremost, I, I think I've uh, divided uh, a lot of the responses that I've seen and I've actually took part of into uh, reactive, you know, that was in the midst of, of COVID-19. And if you had active trials or you had trials uh, that were just about to uh, recruit, you had to quickly pivot. And uh, it was a test of your state of digital transformation, mm -hmm. uh, your resiliency on, on whatever domain uh, you want to measure it on. And uh, if, you, if you actually had, uh, you know, good measures of communicating with your, uh, your vendors and, uh, and having a two-way uh, type of communication. And then as we, as we got data back and uh, actually we've used many of the same proprietary and external tools that have been mentioned thus far and uh, almost forecasting and predictions. And I'm going to say probably it was uh, just as good as if I flipped a coin because some states uh, um, actually turned out to be great and, and others not and reopened and closed uh, in different phased approach. Uh, th that's kind of my, my commentary on that. But it moved into a reactive, into a, a proactive type of space. I would say it got comfortable two to three months into it. And now let's establish the checklist. Let's establish the vetting process. And of course, if you were disciplined before, you carried many of them over. If you were digitally transformed before, you carried those over. And then the special attention 
into even the specifics. I'm a, I'm a neurologist. I still see, uh, I have a small practice and kind of looking into what your vendors are doing actually in their own response and, and, and own employee response to COVIDs and screenings of court sites uh, and, and so on. Even the phase one studies, I think this was brought in, uh, healthy volunteers. Uh, what do we do? We actually took uh, approach of even having competitive types of enrollments, uh, things that classically would be recruited in a matter of a month or two. Uh, we had to open them up many, many sites and have these types of contingencies, especially when we saw holes in the processes that are going down. When I talk about this polarization and, and resiliency, uh, it, it, the, I've been doing probably virtual trials for, for four or five years, and it's become a hot commodity in, in, in this type of environment and, and the settings in which I was doing those, either hybrid or, or fully decentralized, uh, those were much more advanced in their relations with vendors and uh, already interoperable paperless types of environments, uh, even the CROs uh, that, that we brought on board and they internalized some and made some proprietary you know, efficiencies out of it uh, and kind of license those out to others. And then there was the ones that were just waiting on the sideline and, and this happened. And I, I hear actually throughout this conversation being forced, forced to change mm -hmm. or being forced to take uh, trials to patients. Uh, it's unfortunate that it took the backs of, uh, of a fatal, you know, deadly type of uh, infection, a public health disaster. But that, that, that really has been the mo motivation for, for a lot. And I, I mean, this is the, the sense of polar, polarizing. Uh, either being forced or this was actually part of your trajectory. And, and I'm getting a sense that if it was part of your trajectory, then you've made you know, prudent decisions and you forecasted for it in your incorporated technologies. Um, if you were forced and if you had deep pockets, you know, bigger pharma, then you could catch, you know, you could kind of secure contracts with those. Otherwise you were left behind in this whole queue of the ones that were doing it well. Uh, I could take deeper dive into this. So I don't want to monopolize all this time. Yes. Those are great comments. I'm seeing a lot of people nodding. Uh, would someone like to jump in? Jay, what about on, you're very quiet. I, <laughs> what about from uh, Dicerna's perspective? Uh, did you notice any, the similar kind of polarization of, of your provider um, landscape? And was it difficult for you to uh, access some of the new services uh, that uh, decentralized trials required? Sure. So I think I agree with a lot of those comments. And, um, you know, as we uh, look to quickly pivot, um, as we all were faced with this uh, ever emerging um, uh, pandemic, um, and we wanted to ensure patient continuity, um, we, uh, we thankfully had some um, providers already in place. And then I will say uh, kudos to our CRO partners who um, had, you know, we were able to access vendors via their relationships. So um, still being a smaller to, you know, a smaller biotech, um, maybe we don't have the same pull, um, but we utilized our relationship via our CRO um, to uh, get the necessary uh, vendors that we needed to be put in place or the necessary priority um, that we wanted um, to be treated like big pharma, even though we were a small biotech. So I think it's definitely being creative. Um, and uh, as they say, um, it's also about who, who you know. So I think um, we all pulled a couple of favors out, um, out of our pockets at times when needed uh, to get things done. Um, yeah. Great. Excellent. Love those comments. Anyone else want to add to that? No? Okay, I'm going to move to the next question. So this is one in particular for Mustafa. Uh, with so much fluctuation and change uh, to manage as a result of COVID-19 and other uh, challenges you had at AMAG, you mentioned relying on your CRO partners, just as kind of Jay mentioned, uh, to help you quickly incorporate and, inc and implement new technologies. Um, can you share some examples and some of the benefits that you experienced? Yes, thank you. I think it um, kind of... Uh, relates to what um, I mentioned early on and so far as, you know, uh, revisiting the entire trial design and asking questions of every data point that's being collected, you know, what could be done differently, what needs to be done uh, better, and how can we make this m more patient-friendly. Um, so one of the... Um, 
I guess, examples of, of something like this was a uh, um, clinical trial uh, post marketing requirement in the pediatric population uh, for anemia. This was for um, our um, product uh, in um, uh, which is an iron uh, supplement or uh, infusion uh, for iron deficiency anemia, uh, Ferrahim. Um, and we were obviously struggling like everybody else um, which, so far as um, you know moving the, the, the uh, trial forward simply because it required a visit to the infusion center or the research site. Um, it required um, um, a few hours of um, you know putting in an IV line and, and infusion uh, and then watching the patient um, for, for a period of time, making sure everything's okay and then allowing them to return home. Of course, the patients being minor, it also necessarily meant that uh, the uh, uh, parent or the guardian had to accompany them as well. So there are a lot of here mm -hmm. challenges um, that uh, even if the patient wasn't at risk or the patient was able to participate, the, par the uh, parent or guardian might have had issues. So um, one of the ways that we looked at this was that, okay, can we identify a vendor or partner uh, that uh, will have the capability of actually um, um, bringing the, the the procedure, doing the procedure, putting in the IV, and in 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 fact, uh, doing the infusion right at home. Um, particularly um, in in this case, uh, in the uh, elements of of it that would allow that would be that it was already an approved drug, at least for adults, uh, that it was a, um, the safety was relatively well established uh, in that uh, really the, the patients other than, and of course, anemia were not, you know, deathly ill or then have um, acute uh, illness to deal with, uh, such as like an infection or cancer or something like that. So, um, so in that case, so we had to look um, at uh, um, partners um, who had the capability um, for much of what I think, you know, Sean, I really enjoyed Sean's presentation. Sean was um, uh, explaining in terms of uh, the capabilities of having, uh, you know, a, 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 a research nurse who could be on a mobile unit, uh, having the capabilities of, uh, um, you know, not just phlebotomy and, um, the usual data collection, but actually in, 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 uh, a placement of an IV line, et cetera, uh, uh, in an outpatient uh, basis, uh, and capability of in, infusion uh, and capability of supervision uh, remotely. Um, and assessing the capabilities of how that could be possible, whether or not um, it would in, in, in incur additional cost, or can the vendor or the CRO that was uh, that, uh, helping us could do that. So and in our case, I think we quickly found out that the uh, CRO that we were working with being a more established um, 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 company with a, a lot of um, subcontractors or vendors in, 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 in their um, ecosystem, if you will, were able to, you know, give us some good uh, recommendations uh, uh, with, um, you know, very real possibilities of solving these things. Inevitably, obviously, all of these things um, mean additional costs. And so the, the um, trade-off for us was to determine, you know, the trade-off of time and completion of the trial versus the additional cost of um, um, essentially mobilizing uh, the uh, clinical um, trial site. Um, uh, and, and that was sort of what we had to do uh, and, you know, make the appropriate recommendations uh, and make the appropriate choices. So on the whole, Mustafa, do you think that was uh, certainly, um, you know, an advantage for the patient to remain, uh, remain in their home? Is that something that you believe uh, you will continue post-pandemic? Yes, yes, good question. Uh, from my perspective, uh, yes. Um, I, I think that, well, I mean, it, it, I mean well, you, you say yes in the sense that 
it, it, it does allow a lot of patients to participate who would otherwise not be able to do mm -hmm. uh, all the things that Sean talked about in terms of the follow-up data and what needs to be done. Um, but also, I think that um, it does force us, uh, you know, we all talk about patient-friendly, um, patient-centric clinical trials. You know, the word is uh, such a buzzword, everybody's, you know, tossing it around. But I think the COVID situation has um, really forced us to um, think specifically about, you know, every procedure, every intervention, every um, visit uh, that we do as part of a clinical trial to see what, well, to ask the question, is this really patient-centric patient or not? Can this be done um, uh, safely, obviously, uh, in a, 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 you know, a patient's home? Can this visit be done at patients' homes, so on and so forth. So I think that mm. is something that will continue. We will probably have of many more of those visits. So certainly, not every, this is not meant to be for every visit, but I think that um, what I foresee is that in the future, we will move into a hybrid situation where, uh, you know, what we thought would be a routine, you know, clinic visit for a trial will no longer be that, that routine visit. It'll have to be asked, can this be done virtually? And which would be much more substantial than a, a phone call. Um, and I think more accurate and better. Uh, and therefore, uh, it'll leave the clinical visit, uh, clinical research site visit to a, a frequency that is an absolute must have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly we, there will be a minimum number, but it will be kept to a minimum. And I think it ultimately will benefit um, a lot of patients and uh, enable more patients to participate. As I think Sean made a point there that, you know, it opens up the geography and that somebody else mentioned that early on that uh, patients are no longer limited to a certain radius within which they have to be living to participate in a trial. They could participate from, um, you know, far, far away distances. Those are very good points. I had not realized the, the, the limitation that uh, some of these uh, geographies could present. I'd love to hear from Shannon uh, to maybe weigh in on this from a, a CRO perspective, just in terms of the uh, closer partnerships that you might have um, built with, with your clients to help uh, execute these changes uh, on behalf of your, your customers. Um, Shannon, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, well, I think so much of this was kind of quick learning. You know, a lot of us had been dabbling with or trying to implement various forms of, you know, hybrid decentralization, but hadn't quite been thrown into the deep end as we were, um, you know, forced by our environment, of course. So, you know, I do think one of the, the bigger things that we had to work together on as far as collaboration is just kind of understanding business continuity planning for a lot of these vendors. We were coming up with backup plans to the backup plans because so much in the landscape was, was a little bit unpredictable for us, right? So we found ourselves having conversations that were certainly a little bit higher risk than some of us were used to taking, but it was a collaborative risk in most cases. You know, we had as you can imagine, certain indications, these were truly life-saving therapies or patients screening in and ready to be dosed and treated. And we were having to work with vendors in the logistics space and needed to make sure that they were able to come through. Um, you know, all in all, if, if, when you take a step back and kind of consider some of the accomplishments that, that we were collectively able to pull off with this, it was nothing short of astounding, really, and in a lot of cases. And you know, uh, I'm not sure we're going to go back from that. So the the pressure may be on in that <laughs> in that regard. But yeah. Um, but yeah, certainly it was uh, it was forced creativity and mm -hmm. uh, and you know all in all huge. I agree completely, Sean. I think that you know the returning to the old ways is highly unlikely, as is the case for a lot of other things. For instance, you know, just returning to offices uh, is going to be. Um, probably not likely for most of us in this um, business. So uh, I absolutely couldn't agree with you more that I think that the, the um, you know, the, the, some of the benefits that we're already seeing from this hybrid model are going to be part and parcel of how we conduct business in the future. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. 
Okay, I'm going to move to the next question. Uh, this one's for Catherine. Um, yes. <clears throat> you shared that Alexion had developed some really compelling uh, analytics to navigate COVID-19 and, and find the patients for your trials. Uh, and this absolutely supported trial continuity, uh, but there was a flip side. You, order, you observed the decline in quality and a data entry challenge at some of the sites. How were you able to address this? Thank you, Farah. I'm, I'm so excited about all that I have to say, and I know we don't have much time. So I'm going to, to tell the, I think what was the, the um, best partnership and leadership that I discovered through working together under a COVID pandemic. And that is that we, um, besides the analytics, which we talked about earlier, to get ahead of where the patients will be and how they can get into the clinics, when we realized that there was going to be, certainly when we started Italy, we were not going to have our, our usual um, information coming in, we decided to pull together a task force creating work streams and really patient centricity, as you mentioned, Mustafa was one really key point. Um, but we went through and we developed six or seven what we consider to be our business continu continuity um, points, certainly regulatory agencies and the information we would get from them. And then we sought to see, well, how much data would be missing and how much would be there but missing source data verification. I think that was the key. And then mirror that to what are our upcoming interim analysis and database locks? And we created a process where the study teams, so those individuals who were closest to the sites and to our vendor partners would need to complete essentially a slide deck to tell us what is the state of your data. And the statistician would have to run trial interpretability reviews. And then we would bring that data to a leadership board and we would talk about whether or not we would have those interim analysis or whether or not we would need to delay them. And we did developed our decision making based on a framework. If it was a decision that would go to a regulatory agency, it would have the highest weight and go to the highest level of decision making. If it was for an ad board, a go, no go decision, that would go to a different level of decision making. And we found that through that process that we, we also learned about each other, but also about what um, the sites were suffering to do, what our vendors were suffering to do. And we continued to use that process. So I think that's what I'm most proud of. And certainly all the analytics uh, are important to infuse that information, but ultimately it was the way in which we developed the frame framework of decision-making about what we should do with what we have today. That's great. So definitely the formality of those reviews and, and having um, alignment at the leadership level uh, facilitated that uh, the execution of the approach. Uh, so it's, it's great to hear that you had that alignment in, in at Alexion uh, right through to leadership. Yeah, I mean, what we are trying to do is protect patients. And in, to, do, to do that, we needed to make sure that we were inspection ready at any time. And that having that documentation of how we came to our decisions and making sure that we had an algorithm for decision making, we felt would be the best way to keep that trial integrity, to keep data integrity, and to understand that there are some locations where they may not have data. So rather than doing that 100% SDV, we actually were doing risk-based monitoring and making sure that we were following um, a process that could be repeated so that we weren't making it up as we go, but we were also learning from it. We also had um, some data, visualiz data visualization tools that we were able to take in, for example, where protocol deviations being tracked appropriately when visits were missed. So we had that oversight piece that I think was also very important. It's a great, <clears throat> I just love the, uh, the formality in the process, um, excellent. Thank um, you. Anyone else, anyone else want to uh, jump in on that topic? If not, we'll kind of move to the, uh, the next one. Okay, so this one is, uh, again, for Shannon, uh, looking at the CRO perspective. So we talked a little bit about um, kind of, uh, we, you touched upon it in your, in your prior comment on uh, the selection of third-party providers. Um, so how were you able to adopt kind of a vetting process to ensure that those, uh, those providers were suitable to the new normal? 
Yeah, so I, I mentioned, uh, you know, kind of having an understanding of our vendors business continuity plans, but you know, all in all, it's a, you know, 100% just our risk based approach, you know, in, in the in the beginning of it all, it was, you know, on the job immediate. And, uh, you know, as we work through the learnings, we of course formed task forces with different work streams, um, some focused on logistics, some focused on what we were just talking about with respect to data currency and delivery, given where trials were in the life cycle altogether. And then of course, work streams focused on our employees. So when we took the approach of how to understand what our vendors could and couldn't or would and weren't providing at the time, we actually we had to go out and find backups. We needed to consider whether or not um, in uh, centralized situations, we needed to consider, consider alternative strategies. I mean, a, a lot of this obviously focused around protocol and study design in general. So when we're looking at how we assess managing this for current studies that we're being asked to evaluate, we are very heavily looking at patient visit schedules and uh, kind of weighing in on where there may be opportunity for telehealth visits as opposed to patients coming in, alternative strategies with respect to, you know, lab draws, diagnostics that can be handled. You know, Sean kind of teed us up for some of that with his discussion around just digital platforms and working with mm -hmm with groups like THREAD as well. Uh, certainly assessing uh, home health care as a backup strategy. You know, I would say for, for anyone who is outsourcing to any CRO at this point, when putting a proposal in front of us and asking us to weigh in strategically and operationally on how we would deliver whatever it is you're asking us to assess, there should always be a COVID wave two strategy or a virtual decentralized hybrid strategy built into that if for conversation, if nothing else, right? You may not embrace the entire proposal uh, that we put in front of you, but elements of it will most likely be compelling. Your team may or may not have thought about that at that point as well. But if we're not talking about it, then we're not ready to pivot and make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to add something interesting that Alexion did was, and from this was mostly from the medical groups, but they created a COVID-19 reading club, um, which I thought was a genius and very rare. So uh, I'd like to offer that as a suggestion. Well, well, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's an opportunity for, for us to look outside of just what our functional responsibilities are and see see what's happening uh, in the COVID-19 literature. As we know, it's it's increasing. In the beginning, mm -hmm. it was very difficult, but now it's it's interesting. And also to be a part of it. So as we share here today, but to actually share in journals so that we can we can do the best that we can do as a society in the industry. So I find that to be very enlightening. Absolutely. Yeah. And it gives you a good broad understanding of, uh, you know, uh, the issues that may be occurring outside of your kind of departmental focus, but would still have an impact. And uh, we did get a comment from Nancy Sacco um, earlier. She agrees with Shannon, the impact of COVID-19 on starting or ongoing uh, trials is, um, is important. And as I mentioned, since the activities and obligations were never in the original plans and strategies. Nancy. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, okay, I'm going to shift uh, back to Bev. Uh, I'll slightly modify this question, Bev, since you did mention um, the use of, uh, of the automation technology and Intellia for RFPs, uh, you, the clinical maestro tool. Um, Definitely just kind of thinking about it now, um, you know, given that uh, we are in the second wave um, and there is uh, an increased vetting period going on, uh, how can you, again, leverage the technology tools that you've uh, onboarded uh, to help, help kind of execute that vision in the landscape today? Uh, you mentioned bringing in some vendors kind of earlier um, has there has there been any other learnings over the course of the last kind of six months on how you could use that technology to uh, continue to vet suppliers for their readiness through this second wave? Yeah, so I think um, I think it's uh, it's interesting, Shannon, building off of Shannon's comments a few minutes ago on you know kind of how do you further think about what's occurring in the environment and how do we adopt to that, which is. You, the nice thing with using a technology, again, that 
that somebody else has built but also has flexibilities um, would be to build in some of those additional things that maybe we hadn't thought about previously around how you might consider managing through that pandemic. So, you know, building in different scenarios, which again, the technology that we utilize, Clinical Maestro, um, you have the ability to do kind of the standard. You have the ability to allow each of your CROs to have kind of what they, as they interpret your protocol and they look at what you're proposing, on what they think would fit in terms of, you know, different countries, different considerations around kind of the structure from a CRO perspective. But then you could also build in, you know, this other permutation around uh, as we continue to already, Europe is already facing the second wave, you know, how does the CRO think about certain things around the remote monitoring, um, even about some of the things on visit schedule, all of those things could be built into looking at an additional, um, you know, different scenario uh, planning and, and the costing tool of that um, to, to understand what your options are. I think those are great comments. Uh, you know, certainly we've seen uh, among sponsors just that greater um, bringing in these these approaches into the RFP process, basically broadening the RFP process for contingency planning uh, and using technology to uh, to process all of that data, uh, even if it isn't still in the planning stage. Um, we are having to, you know, have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C, and, and possibly a plan D. Uh, so we're talking about, you know, quadrupling uh, data that might uh, sit in static data sources. So definitely uh, some of the, the points that Shaheen had brought forward before around uh, the progress of digital transformation uh, will help organizations uh, get more strategic in the RFP process. So fair, if I may. Um, sure. You know, so... I think disaster preparedness is something that we don't do well. And when you, you know, you, you plan, you, when you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. Yeah. That's, that's the Margella's law. And we know that hurricanes happen. We've all experienced them. Mm -hmm. So part of, I think, our vetting of sites is what is your preparedness plan? What's your disaster preparedness plan? We need to get ahead of that. So that's another opportunity I think we have to improve as, a, as an industry. Absolutely. I remember uh, in my CRO days um, being asked those questions on a routine basis and you had the, the disaster plan, but definitely uh, being able to execute the disaster plan, I think is a, a whole other challenge. Yeah, and that's the evidence of simulations and not, mm -hmm. not written simulations, but what do you have in place? You know, who are your suppliers? Um, and keeping that up to date, just as we do with 1572. I think that it's, it's pandemics will happen Hurricanes will happen. We just simply, as, as a global uh, entity, we just haven't come, come to put the money and invest the money into making sure that we're prepared. Absolutely. I think having experienced this now in our lifetimes, uh, hopefully we can change that. We can all uh, influence that in some way. Um, okay, last question here before we get to the polls. Uh, so this one was... Uh, I was kind of referring to Catherine and Mustafa, but definitely all of you have uh, had some mention of the theme of compromise. Uh, so we're talking about uh, trade-offs and compromise uh, as key themes in selecting vendors and in the landscape today with uh, things moving so rapidly. Uh, I'd love to get uh, some others to chime in on this. Uh, how has this impacted the diligence process uh, uh, Catherine just talked about kind of looking at disaster planning. Um, any other elements that we'd like to share here? Uh, I think this is definitely pertinent uh, to uh, today's environment. Uh, are you asking me to comment, sir? Uh, Farah? I, I'm, I'm asking for anyone yeah. to raise sure. their no, hand. I, I, I think one thing that I can ahead. say is that, yeah. you know, um, <clears throat> You remember about five or six years ago, uh, Tom Friedman, who's a, a syndicate um, journalist at, uh, and, and writes for the New York Times and also author of many books, wrote a book called The, the World is Flat. And in, in it, the, the premise of, the, of, the, um, um, of his book was that uh, with new technology, essentially, 
everyone has a uh, even playing field. Mm -hmm. um, um, whether you're in America or in China or India or Europe, wherever you are, uh, everybody has a um, has a. Uh, level playing field and everyone can access the same type of information. I think this is also in a way has become true for us because when we think about selecting new vendors, um, uh, um, I think the old um, ways of uh, gravitating towards the, you know, well-known names and geographies, et cetera, is um, now kind of out the door because um, we will, we're looking at everybody, um, you know, regardless of their geographic location, because a lot of the uh, activities, work, et cetera, will be done in such a way that it, um, it doesn't require proximity, geographic proximity. You know, we don't have to stick with, uh, you, you know, vendors that are in the Boston area or in the Northeast U.S. or even in the East Coast. It can be in anybody in the West Coast or, you know, Canada or outside of the U.S. Um, so that is even more, I think, going to be the norm than it had been. So uh, in, in that sense, uh, I think that it gives, uh, uh, provides us with a wider selection of vendors all over the world that could potentially be a partner for any company uh, in this space. Those are fantastic insights. So essentially it's changing the criteria. Uh, it's broadening the, the, the scope or the net that you're kind of casting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it actually changes what might be the priorities and selection criteria as well. Um, Absolutely. Yes. Great. Anyone else like to chime in there? I'm trying to see if there's uh, any questions, perhaps Jay from your side? Sure, so, um, you know, I think our diligence has uh, only increased in echoing a lot of the comments, so I'm trying not to be repetitive, but I think um, it, it is interesting as we uh, continue to embark and we, and we, and we are pressed to, uh, to, to really expand our, our offerings and to um, think outside the norm. Um, as I truly believe, as I said this morning, that it, there will be a paradigm shift in the way we're conducting these trials. Um, and with that, um, it does require increased vetting, I think, because we're, we're, uh, many of us are taking on uh, new offerings or trying out new technology. Um, so there's the uncertainty of trying something new in already uncertain times and coupling that together, um, you have to do a risk assessment of how, how, how much risk are you willing to take on in, in trying out something new um, on let's say a pivotal study, um, mm -hmm. how much are you willing to, how much risk are you willing to take on? Um, because it doesn't always go as planned as we know. Um, and there's a lot of uh, flying the plane as we're building it, unfortunately. Um, so I think there's finding that balance, finding that compromise. Um, and um, for me and for our organization, a lot of it is uh, building upon our networks, whether it's our prior networks, our existing networks, uh, using our vendors' networks um, to really uh, try to get a leg up or some type of an insight um, on our vetting process. Absolutely. Shaheen, did you want to add something to that? Oh, sure. Yes. Uh, uh, just to add on to, to Jay's comments, yeah, we're all constantly compromising. I, I actually live between the worlds of digital health and uh, biopharma, and uh, digital health has always compromised, right? Because <laughs> we've uh, often used uh, unvalidated uh, measures, uh, valued more data, uh, then validation, uh, and then more recently have gone through more regulated uh, types of processes. The, the fun thing about the, or one of the consequences of, uh, of the pandem pandemic and the biopharma's response, uh, pharma is subsidizing uh, the validation of many of these remote measures. They are now gonna have trickle down effects in digital therapeutics. You're seeing deals with click therapeutics and BI and Atsuka and so on, on co-development. Um, I think we've moved well beyond, you know, telehealth and telemedicine. I remember maybe 15, 20 years ago doing telestroke mm -hmm. consoles at Cleveland Clinic uh that that's not on the forefront but i think that's what gets most of the press that's that's yeah. been here to stay that's going to continue to stay now i think we're getting equitable reimbursements for it it's it's this whole other digital ecosystem uh that is the transformation in my opinion mm -hmm. and uh, not just to support traditional healthcare systems or traditional trial development but actually uh, to serve on its own uh and so this is the essential pillar 
uh, that that's meant to be. Uh, having said that, um, this is the pessimist in me. I'm seeing, since I, I represent a few companies now, uh, a, a little drift back, a little uh, drift to the mean comfort uh, as there's some uh, you know, resemb uh, semblance of normalcy that's reintroduced in our lives and certainly in some of these uh, investigative sites in, in different uh, states. And uh, I'm, I'm really what's going to stick and what's going to be durable is, is up to us as a collective community. Uh, regulation drives it tremendously. You, you've seen exactly. how you responded to many of those rapid uh, guidances and, and letters. Uh, mm -hmm. What's going to stick, right? Regulation is what drives transformation in, in industry. I mean, I, I hate to admit it, <laughs> but, but that's what it does. <laughs> uh, and I, I think we're going we're gonna to lead um, uh, by, by uh, the heels of uh, health regulators and how they continue uh, to accept this challenge and pivot and adapt, how much missing data. I mean, here the, here's the thing. A lot of studies, if they continue doing what they were doing, uh, particularly in a reactive mode, they would have missing data. Uh, there's a realization that, hey, we could digitally collect vital signs, EKG, even other types of metrics and, and PROs and clinically reported outcomes. They might not be as good. They might not be validated, uh, but it's better than missing data. So if we, mm. if we take that stance and regulators hold that stance and they'll revert to uh, the, the previous stance, then I think we're good. Yeah. Yeah, Shaheen, I completely agree. I believe that the regulatory agencies have given us an amber light, not a green light. And I think it's up to us to show proof that we're ready for a green light. Yes. Well said, Catherine. So the, the business person to me will say that, uh, will concur that absolutely uh, regulation does provide the pathway, but it, it also provides opportunity. Uh, so we are presented with the opportunity today uh, to transform uh, and hopefully not to be forced to transform, but to do so out of, uh, out of strategy.